In the spring of 2008, Marvel announced plans for production on Iron Man 2. After you do a first film, and if it's been a hit, as you hope it will be, that's half the work right there. I mean, it really is, okay, we've hit the tone, we've hit the characterizations, People now know this character and like this character, and that gives you a lot of freedom to jump into what story you want to tell next. At the conclusion of Iron Man, Tony Stark reveals himself as the shiny superhero, setting up an intriguing storyline for the movie's sequel. I am Iron Man. I think it was a very fresh thing to do at the end of the first movie to announce that he was Iron Man and to not do the secret identity thing. It was a very fresh take, and I think it allows for a whole world of possibilities that don't normally exist in this kind of a movie. Part of the difficulty of these superhero movies is everything's been done. So how do you make it different? Not only from our first film, but from what everybody else is doing. There's only so many scenarios. You'd imagine in some ways that the origin story complete, that the Iron Man franchise, there's, there's no way to go, but a, a rehash of all the exciting bits having occurred. And I thought, well, no, because we only scratched the surface of Ian Pepper, and I knew once Scarlet came on board for Black Widow, that was something. There have been good sequels, there have been not so good sequels. Um, and what we've learned, and we learned early on, is you can't just feel the pressure to add the new character, add this fan favorite, put in this new villain. Um, you'll collapse very quickly under the weight of all your characters. So what we try to do now, what I think we've achieved in, in Iron Man 2, is only introduce the characters, the new characters, um, that will have an impact on your main characters. We've got that with the Black Widow, Natasha Romanoff. Black Widow's character dates back to the 1960s and is one of the rare Marvel creations that has changed radically through the years. When she was introduced, she was really a femme fatale. She literally wore like a widow's veil <laughs> and a pillbox hat. The Black Widow springs from the, the 60s spy genre. Uh, she's a Russian defector. She, she, she came out of a project called The Red Room where she was taught to be the, the perfect Russian spy. And then she, she comes to the States and becomes a, a part of the superhero community here and rebels against you know her Cold War masters of the past. And it, it's the perfect name for her because she's beautiful and she's deadly. You have this temptress, shape-shifting female character, Black Widow, played exquisitely by Scarlett Johansson. I loved the first movie so much. And so as soon as I heard that there was a possible part in the second installment, I was all, all over it. You know, I was desperate to be a part of it. Oh, wow. Very, very impressive individual. So She's fluent in you know French. That. Rule number one, never take your eye off your opponent. <laughs> Scarlett was just a dream, you know, she's so game. Natalie is so complex and kind of unreadable, and she had a really good time doing it. Marvel and the filmmakers were quite pleased with Scarlett Johansson's film interpretation of the femme fatale. Scarlett did an amazing job, not just in her performance, but in her training. There, I mean, she has some of the best moments in the entire movie. Giving away the secrets here. Whoa. I was certainly more than willing to, to, part, to be a part of, of the, uh, part of the action, so to speak. And I wanted to um, really sell it. You know, I wanted to, to know what it feels like to, you know, to hurdle over giant bodyguards and, you know, do all kinds of flippy things. She spent hours and hours and hours for months, by far the most dedicated uh, actor when it came to the stunt work and the physical work. She really wanted to make the most of it. And as a result, we used to double very little. I was, I think I was, you know, really wanted to prove something to myself. But at the same time, I'm very sensitive when you see those action movies and, you know, it's like the back of somebody's head and then all of a sudden they give that one pose at the end and you're like, that was not, you know, that was the lamest thing. You know, you want to see the actor risking their life, you know. It's part of what makes, uh, what, what sells it, I think, as an audience member. And I, you know, like I said, I'm sensitive about that sort of thing. So I. I would want to, I never would want to be that, you know, I wouldn't want to be perceived as like a wuss who couldn't do it, I guess. You really believe that as she's moving through this, uh, this hallway full of these, uh, these guards that she's able to do her flips and turns and grabs, it was pretty inspired. And she learned a lot of it, she did wire work herself, and then it was about designing the costume. I looked at every visual reference for Black Widow and talked to the producers, because they were obviously really, really in, interested in what it was going to become, and, so, and same with John. And so we did a rendering with her in the, the outfit. That was done on a computer. And the first one, it was not painstaking. The first illustration got the approval. Final fitting. Doesn't she look great? What do you think? 
questions, comments, concerns? She, she weighed 170 pounds when I hired her. That's what she got. I don't think I've ever worn anything like it before. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not certainly not like a deep sea diver, but I can imagine that it's sort of like a wetsuit. Um, it's a, you know, one piece kind of unitard of <laughs> some sort, a sexy unitard. Um, and, uh, you know, the first time I tried it on, I mean, Obviously, it's been a lot of, you know, I've been I've been really, like, training and trying to get fit for this costume and make it look just right. And, um, you know, it certainly, Mary Zofries has helped me in a lot of ways just by designing something that I think is, is both functional and looks really badass. Tony Stark also unveiled a series of new suits in Iron Man 2. You know, it's almost an unfair advantage we have at Marvel Studios because we've got all of the comics, and the, and the best comic artists in the world have worked on our on our comics, um, going back uh, 50 years and even and even today. So we have amazing inspiration to, to start from. Um, we also have the best artists working in film today, here on staff at Marvel Studios that work from production to production, and, and led by Ryan Minerby. To Mark III, it was such a successful design, and everyone sort of uh, embraced it so much. It's, it's, it's difficult because the mandate was to sort of change it in enough ways that you could tell it was it was different, but not um, not make it look radically different. But one of the things that makes Iron Man interesting but also difficult is the fact that you're you have this really elaborate suit-up sequence. So realistically, the only place he can become Iron Man is back at the garage. The suitcase suit was sort of born out of wanting to make sure that if he's around the world, he could still be Iron Man and, and not have to travel back to Malibu and jump in the Iron Man suit. The realities of trying to, to actually have a suit come out of a suitcase have been somewhat challenging. We did a little bit of math, and the, the actual surface area that covers a body could actually fit into a, a case that's not much bigger than a, than a briefcase. The way this suitcase suit deploys, that's right out of the comics. You know, in the 60s, he would open up, it looked like a regular briefcase, he'd open it up, put on a glove, put on a boot, the gold would magically come over him, and he was in the Iron Man suit. We took that as our inspiration uh, to put together the Mark V. Tony is, is always searching, is always tinkering, is always trying to uncover something. And we never want it to be just a purely technical um, challenge for him. It always links into, you know, it's hard to separate Tony from his tech. It's, it's one. You know, in the first movie, we made it very clear that, that this is a metaphor for his, for his heart. And we continue that metaphor, um, I think, to great effect in, in the sequel, in the development of the Mark VI. And the big change is that triangle. But for the Mark VI, Tony would have to get some help from a familiar face. Sam Jackson has tremendous screen presence. So just the idea that we stuck him in the first one was a bit of a, a lark. And now, you know, much like uh, when we said, I am Iron Man, uh, some decisions that were made in the first one ended up determining our whole path in the second. And he makes a, a return appearance and hits Tony Stark when he's perhaps at his lowest point. I knew that Sam Jackson was gonna be a little more central, and I thought that was great. It was my purpose to come in and actually give more or less a history of who Tony Stark's dad was and what his position in the Marvel Universe should be. Clearly, you know my dad better than I did. As a matter of fact, I did. He was one of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. What? S.H.I.E.L.D. has its hands and fingers in everything as a peacekeeping force. If there's something mysterious going on in the world, S.H.I.E.L.D. is there. Nick Fury is one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s top commanders. Since the 1960s, Fury's been an indispensable part of the Marvel Universe. You know, you have this great grizzled war vet, Nick Fury, Sergeant Fury, who, who ends up running this uh, international organization, peacekeeping organization. This is a way of taking a character who you think might have been misplaced in the 60s and finding a place for him. Nick is Nick, I mean, you like, and you kind of take him for granted. Um, I think the choices they made in the Ultimates was very much to make people pay attention to the book, pay attention to Marvel, and say, we're willing to play with our characters in a way that we think will make them more relatable now. What if they were born 40 years later? And, and what if they were trying to create the Marvel Universe today? How would they envision it? How would it be different? So we created this whole new Marvel Universe that was based around different sciences and, and modern day technology and modern day attitudes of people. We sort of re-envisioned S.H.I.E.L.D. and S.H.I.E.L.D. became more of a militaristic force uh, as opposed to just a peacekeeping force, still international, but much more proactive in what it was that they were doing. 
recreating Nick Fury as an African American character, which we felt was 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 something that we 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 needed to do. The movie version, very inspired by the Ultimates version, uh, with the help of Mr. Jackson, and uh, he's proven to be very cooperative on the publishing side. Also, when I was a kid, Nick Fury was a white guy running through the jungle with a whole bunch of other white guys, and then he was David Hasselhoff, and then all of a sudden I picked up a book one day and it's like, hey, that's me. Oh, wow. Hey, I'm Nick Fury. I look at comic books. I always see them as movies anyway. I have for a very long time. So all of a sudden, it was like, well, I got this job. I don't have to audition. I don't have to do anything. I just got to wait on the green light to move in. I'm in. I was, you know, all in favor of it. Plus, you know, I've always liked, you know, Nick Fury, even when he was a white guy. I liked him. You know, he was very cool. Howard said the arc reactor was a stepping stone to something greater. He was about to kick off an energy race that was going to dwarf the arms race. He was on to something big, something so big that it was going to make the nuclear reactor look like a triple-A battery. Howard Stark is an integral figure in the Marvel Universe. He's kind of the godfather of the whole thing. You know, he worked on Captain America's super soldier program. He birthed Tony Stark. He was associates with Nick Fury. He's an important figure. Tony, this is the key to the future. One day you'll figure this out. And when you do, you will change the world. Although Howard Stark played an instrumental role in the events of Iron Man 2, his influence can also be seen throughout the Marvel Universe. Howard Stark plays a big part in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He even outfit Captain America with his iconic shield. If you look over his shoulder, a certain scene in the workshop of Iron Man 1, you do see what looks to be Captain America's shield, and you see that again in Iron Man 2. What's this doing here? The Marvel Universe is vast, with characters and storylines crossing over each other. But perhaps no other character has inhabited the Marvel Cinematic Universe more than Agent Coulson, played by actor Clark Gregg, first appearing in Iron Man 1. Mr. Stark? Yeah, I can't... Yeah? Agent Coulson. Oh, yeah, 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 the guy from the, uh... Yeah, Strategic Homeland the... Intervention right, Enforcement yeah. Logistics Division. Whew, God, you need a new name for that. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Coulson, after his performance and the reaction to him, it was obvious that we were going to have him in Iron Man 2. And he's the glue. I had loved Iron Man. And then to get a call that they're putting him in Iron Man 2. Director Fury wants me in New Mexico. Fantastic. Land of enchantment. So I'm told. Secret stuff. Something like that. I turned to Kevin Feige and said, what's in New Mexico? And they're like, oh, oh, Thor. Thor. You're in Thor. Did anyone tell you? Sir, we found it.